Sam, thank you, praise team, and thank you, congregation. Welcome to Friend Day today, and I have been told not only is it Friend Day at Faith Baptist Church, it is St. Patrick's Day, and we're all supposed to wear green. I told the uh, faith class this morning, I said at a certain point in life, you stop worrying about finding green, and you just concentrate on finding what fits. <laughs> and I know I'm probably the only one here that uh, has that battle, but uh, we're glad to see you today, and uh, 
Listen, as glad as I am to see you, I am happiest of all to see Clyde back with us today. Clyde Watts. And uh, he's glad to be with us today. Of course, Clyde has been out uh, <clears throat> with a hip surgery and rehabilitation. We're glad he is back. And uh, I'm told that he's driving now. I asked Dot, I said, did the doctor say he could drive? Well, that doesn't really seem to be too much to the point right now. He is driving. That question's already been answered. Let me just say happy birthday to uh, uh, Brandon Johnson, Devin Lane, Kyle Tyree, and I've got a special note on a young man. And uh, Wyatt, where is Wyatt Ferguson? Wyatt, raise your hand up real high. Yeah, there we go. Wyatt is 16 years old today, and his mama says that he's the pot of gold. You know, when our, when our kids are first born, we're proud to show them off, and then as they get older, we're proud to embarrass them. <laughs> Wyatt, happy birthday to you. And all these, we have anniversaries this week for Cody and Daisy Johnson and Kenny and Donna Lordahl. We just say happy anniversary to you. Give them a big hand this morning. And I am so grateful for each of you who are, how many of you, and we just, we want to recognize our friends and uh, who are here today. You've been invited. If you're not a member of Faith Baptist Church, just lift your hand so we can see who the friends are this week. Hold them up real high. Hold them up high enough and long enough. Faith family, give them a big hand. Thank them for being here. We are so glad to have you. And Faith Family, if you brought a friend, someone who hasn't been here at least in a year, raise your hand if you brought a friend today. Raise your hand. I see lots and lots of hands. Let's give each other a big hand again. Thank the Lord for it. Let me just say, let me just say to, to all of you, whether you're part of the Faith Family or whether you're visiting today, whether you're a guest, welcome home. Amen. Welcome home. Maybe you've come with a heavy heart this morning and you need people to care. You're home. You're home. Maybe you're struggling with questions and disappointments in your life. You need people to share those burdens. You're home. You're home this morning. Maybe you've come with fears and uncertainties. There are those who will pray with you and stand with you and walk with you through those. You're home. Maybe you've come lost, unsure of where you'll spend eternity. Let me say to you, you're home this morning. Because we're going to share with you Jesus Christ and, and what was accomplished when sin was arrested through the work of Jesus Christ. Maybe... You've come this morning with a deep loneliness. You're surrounded by people who care about you. And we say to you, welcome home. Welcome home on this friend day. Welcome home on this day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is every Sunday of the year. Oh 
Thank you so much. You may be seated. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sam and the praise team for that wonderful music. Thank you guys for all of your beautiful singing this morning. Get a little bit of an idea of what heaven is going to sound like. And it's going to sound pretty good. So glad to see everybody out here this morning. Good to have all of our guests and our visitors. Uh, we've already acknowledged you by uh, raising of your hand just a second ago, but uh, there's a couple other ways that we want to recognize you today. I won't embarrass you in any way, shape, or form, I promise. But there is a connection card in front of you. It's in the pew there. Uh, it's got connection right on the side of it there. If you would grab that card and fill out as much information on it as you would let us know, and then we have normally been dropping those in the boxes in the back, and that's what we normally say uh, with those connection cards. But we have a, a new connection desk that is back in the back, and, and we would love for you to stop by there and drop that card off. And if you will do that, they have a car wash to the title uh, uh, car wash right down here in front of Walmart. They have a ticket to get in for a, a free car wash for uh, your, your family. Okay, it's one per family. Uh, but if you were turned in that card, then they will give you a, uh, a, a free card to that uh, Tidal Wave car wash right down there. Again, we just love to get to know you a little bit better, love to know that you are uh, here with us. And uh, that new desk back there, by the way, is being manned by Holly and Cohen. Stand up, guys. Yep, I'm going to embarrass both of you. Come on, Holly. Come on. There you go. Now, I've got some news about these two. Cohen is off the market. They got engaged this past weekend. <laughs> so when you guys stop by, thank you very much. So when you guys stop by there to uh, give them that connection card, make sure you say hi to them. She'll be happy to show you the bling. All right, and say congratulations uh, to them. Uh, this coming Wednesday night, we've got a, a full slate of activities going on here at Faith Baptist. If you don't have anywhere else that you're going, we'd love to have you here. It starts at 7 o'clock. It wraps up at about 8.15, and every group has got something going. The kids are downstairs. Teens are in the back building. Seth's got his group going, and all of us adults. And this, the, the number of adults that are coming here on uh, Wednesday night is, is steadily growing, and uh, it's just a good opportunity to get your battery recharged uh, uh, in the middle uh, of the week. So come on out for that. We have a new ministry starting. It's a prayer ministry, and this is going on on Tuesdays at Faith Baptist Church. It's uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then again at 7 o'clock in the evening. And Mark and Wanda, Mark and Wanda, you guys stand up real quick. Let them see who you are. They are leading our prayer ministry. If you have any questions about that, you can see them right after the uh, service today. And they're generally standing uh, right down in the front here. Very, very exciting ministry that is getting started up. Choir, you've got one more rehearsal before the uh, Easter uh, activities go on. So uh, next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, uh, that's the 23rd, uh, the choir rehearsal will be going on. If you have any questions about that, you can see uh, Monica or Jill, and they will be happy to fill you in on all of that. Uh, baptisms, we're going to be baptizing on Easter Sunday morning, and uh, if you have not been baptized and would like to, there's going to be a baptism class. Pastor's going to be leading this next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. I think it's at 10 o'clock. Yes, at 10 o'clock, be right here at church. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby if you would put your name on that uh, sheet just to let the pastor know uh, that you are planning on being here and uh, talking to him about uh, baptism. Uh, the week between Palm Sunday, between so two weeks out, uh, between uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, we normally have a Wednesday evening service and a Wednesday get-together, but we are not going to have that Wednesday, uh, not this coming Wednesday, so the following. We're not going to have that Wednesday, but we are going to have a Good Friday communion service. So that Friday, uh, it'll be March the 29th at 7 o'clock here at church. We'll have a good Friday service. It'll be in lieu of the evening. Nursery will be provided. So come on out and uh, enjoy some fellowship. And uh, we'll have a uh, communion service on that day as well. And then that Sunday will be Easter. And uh, we're going to have one service. It's going to start at 1030 in the morning. We won't have Sunday school classes. We'll have everybody combined upstairs uh, starting at 1030. So no Sunday school classes. 
I thought I was done there, but I had a handful of people come up to me with a couple of other things. So let me just get through these real quick. The Miller Park Outreach Ministry uh, that normally meets uh, on the 23rd next Saturday, uh, they're not going to have that. They're going to postpone that to March the 30th. And uh, you can see Jeff and Mary if you have any questions about that. Uh, we do have some new toddler and nursery policies that are in place. And for those of you who have children in that age group, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for working with us as we implement those new policies. I know it's been a little bit of a, a challenge getting those in place, but uh, we, we appreciate you guys' patience uh, as we work to, to get those implemented. There is a photo op out there in the lobby. So for those of you who want friends and want a recordation of that you do really do have a friend, uh, you can grab a uh, picture with them uh, before you leave the, uh, the lobby today. And uh, we have a great opportunity. Kroger has partners, partnered with our youth group. And for the next several weeks, uh, we didn't have a slide for this. But we, hopefully we can get one up next week. But uh, we have a, an opportunity with Kroger that if you will go onto our website, uh, there's, a, there's a, a link that can take you to get registered with Kroger. And if you go to Kroger and you buy something, And uh, it will take you and it will give you all the information on how uh, to be able to get registered uh, for that. Again, all of you, we are so glad that you are here. Friends, uh, guests, we are so glad that you are here with us. And uh, we pray that the Lord will bless you uh, in a great way. Sam. Thank you, Biff. We're going to switch things up this morning and let you stay seated for a few more minutes. We, uh, we've got Easter coming up, as you know. And what a special day that is. It's the moment when Christ rose again and he became victory over death and in turn let us have victory over death and sin so that we can have eternal life in heaven one day. This morning we would like to sing for you all my victory.
I am going to ask you to stand now as we sing our last song. This is Run to the Father. And I love the words of this. It's, there's a story in the Bible called the prodigal son. Um, but it's so applicable to what we see today. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made, the thing about Jesus, the thing about God is that he's always waiting for you with open arms. I've made mistakes in my life. We all have. We've all sinned. But the beautiful thing about serving God is that He still loves us. He knows we're human and He's ready to forgive us and to wrap His arms around us if you just come to Him. This is Run to the Father.
pray we'd all remember that. You may be seated. Special thanks to our folks. Uh, some of you are sitting in different places because guests sat in your normal place. Some of you are parking in different places and uh, because uh, we have made some changes to allow for the handicap parking and for our guests. Our guests really are our honored guests and, and uh, we're glad for the patience that you've shown. Kay Jones, of course, was a uh, she had to park down at the bottom of the hill, and she came up a huffing and a puffing this morning. And uh, but she's glad to do it. We'll have to get a shuttle service just for Kay, and uh, make make her comfortable. And uh, again, we're glad you're here. Uh, let me say, uh, a certain young man asked me to say, Lexi, happy birthday yesterday to you. Okay, let's give her a big hand. Yesterday, and uh, as Mill. Junior asked me to make sure that she, we, we had a shout out to her on that. Well, let me find the remote. Let's, let's fight with our technology again this morning. Here we go. Well, just on friend day, we want to say to all of you, welcome home. We do not say it as a matter of bragging. We say this as a matter of reality that maybe you're here and you've given up on church. Maybe you've been hurt deeply by Christians. You know, Christians can be some of the meanest people in the entire world when we're out of fellowship with God. And we are living in our hypocrisies, even as our praise team sang about. But you're here today, and we're, we're glad that you're here. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. And uh, the beautiful song that the praise team, well, all of them were beautiful, but the team they, they did last, uh, the song they did last about running to the Father, that's what we're speaking about this morning. And by the way, let me just say one other thing. Thank you to many, many, many that were out here before, even before 9 o'clock this morning, getting things ready, working behind the scenes to ensure safety and comfort of those who are here this morning. We're grateful for all of you that have worked, uh, have, have done extra duty today and will continue for the next three weeks as we anticipate uh, larger than normal crowds on these days. Thank all of you for that. I'm just going to read the scriptures and I'm going to stop a couple places just to in Luke chapter 15 starting in verse 11 he says and he said this is Jesus is, is teaching this. He said, a, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods. He's speaking there about his inheritance that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, um, unless you have a, you're on your uh, phone, and maybe you can't underline it, but if you have a paper Bible, you ought to underline those words, when he came to himself. And we're going to come back to that. He said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I want you to underline those words, circle these, those words. I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him 
and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, and the son said, uh, um, I'm sorry, I was looking down. But the father said to the servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it was my first trip to India. I've been to India at least, at least a dozen times, but this was my first trip. And there are a few words in the English language. There are a few phrases that give as much comfort as the words, welcome home. I've been gone for several weeks, maybe three weeks at the time. And... Uh, it was a different kind of trip. The heat, the smells, the crowds. We even spent 48 hours locked in a hotel because of persecution. And our brothers and sisters being beaten and thrown from buildings. And we were held in a, for another story. We came back and I was physically, spiritually, mentally emotionally exhausted. And I just remember it was just all we could do just to get on the plane and, and our, our minds racing and no real rest. And, and we got off at uh, Dulles Air, uh, Airport there in Washington, C area. And as we were walking toward the customs, and some of you have made that, have made trips where you had to go through customs there and uh, immigration. But I'll never forget that we, as the guard checked their passports and checked my uh, uh, visa and make sure everything asked us why we were in India. But I'll never forget that after the paperwork was complete and after they were satisfied that we were where we should be, he looked at me eye to eye and he said, welcome home. And I probably never had as great a appreciation for home as I did on that day. And I can't even tell you what it meant. Welcome to, yes, the land of freedom. Welcome to the familiar. Welcome to people who love you and care about you. Welcome home. It's all summed up in that little word, welcome home. In chapter 15, we have three parables about finding things that are lost. Let me just say that Jesus taught in parables. He told stories. And a parable is an earthly story about a heavenly truth. So he wants to teach about something that is spiritual and something that, that is eternal. And when he gives these parables, he's telling a story that would be familiar to them and they'd be able to relate to. But there's a higher meaning to each of them. Chapter 15 is often called the lost and found chapter. The first parable is found in verses 1 through 7. It's the lost sheep. You remember the story, the shepherd has 99 sheep and, and uh, one is lost. So he goes out into the storm. He goes out to rescue the one sheep. And the Bible ends, or that parable ends with this phrase, and they rejoiced when they found the one that was lost. In fact, it even says that there's more joy in heaven over one who is found than the 99 who didn't need to be found. The second parable is the parable of the lost coin. As someone lost a coin that was worth a great deal of money and, and they, they couldn't find it. And uh, I can only imagine the fear that they had, the bills that were due, the obligations that they had made. But they looked and looked and looked and they finally found the lost coin. And the Bible says that they rejoiced when they found the lost coin. And then the third is the portion of scripture that we're looking at the lost son is found. Many of us, probably most of us, we understand what this parable is all about. 
There's so many different ways we could, we could go. There are so many ways we could focus on. There are so many things that we, want to, uh, we would want to know about, questions that we had perhaps. And this morning I've had to really struggle this week to just narrow it down to a couple thoughts. A couple thoughts, first of all, about the parable of the, of, of the son who was lost, the prodigal, the one who had left. And then also the father. One of the things about the parables is every parable asks a question, who is the father? Who is the main character? And God is always going to be the main character. The son is not. There's a place, and there's certainly a lot we can learn from the son, the older son, the one who does not rejoice at all in, in what has happened. Uh, he is certainly not the focus of it all. But just to set the, set the stage, if we would, this morning, let me give you three things about the prodigal son. Number one is this. He never intended to end up the way he did. He's raised in a seems to be a good family. He's had some training. He knows that sin not only sins against his father and his family and others, but sin violates God's law. And when he does repent, he's going to acknowledge that he sinned against God. So he's had some training. And yet, like many young people, he's just, he wants to go off on his own. He wants to make his fortune. He never intended to end up where he did. But yet because of bad decisions, bad company, bad investments, he ended up just as low as a man could end up. This young man who was raised in a lap of luxury now finds himself, he finds himself in a pig pen. Now symbolically, some of us here can say, I can relate to that. Some of us here can say, I've made bad decisions in my life and and I, I, I have, uh, I've been in the proverbial pig pen. Maybe not literally, but we've made bad decisions. We've caused great shame upon our family. We've caused shame upon ourselves. And maybe some have come this morning and in your heart, you've been prodigal. And uh, you say to yourself, I can relate to, to him. I never intended to go this far. I never intended to stay this long. I never intended to pay this much. That's what sin does in our life. I believe he thought he'd go and make good investments and uh, become independent and go back and show his father what a great success he had made. But sin doesn't work that way. We sin and we go into sin thinking we're the master of sin. And uh, we control our, our, our destiny but it's not long before we realize that sin has taken charge. We become a slave to that sin in our life. But this man, if you'd have said to the young man, how did you get here? He'd have said, I never intended for it to end up this way. And then number two, he finally came to his senses and he got up and got out. Now this is really, really important and I want you to see this. There in verse 17, I want you to see, it says, and when he came to himself, oh my goodness, how we, how, that's why I asked you to circle that. When he came to himself, he said, how many servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? And I'm sitting here starving to death. I'm eating the husks that the pigs, even the pigs wouldn't eat. I'm trying to find something there to eat, some sort of nourishment in my life. And the Bible says he <clears throat> came to himself. Some versions of the Bible says when he came to his senses. You see, if you're here this morning and you've been saved, it's because there was a time in your life where you came to your senses. You looked at your life. Now, yes, the Holy Spirit of the living God was convicting you of sin and righteousness and judgment. But all of a sudden you woke up one day and it was like you had never seen out of your eyes before. You looked at where you were and you said to yourself, I don't want to be here. I need a change. I need a transformation. I need a change of address. And the Bible tells us that he says to himself, uh, and he came to himself and he declares, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to where my father is. 
Now that's important. You see, you can sit there this morning being a prodigal in your heart. You may be wearing a, you may be wearing, wearing a $500 dress. You may be wearing a $1,000 Italian suit. But in your heart, you could be the prodigal. In your heart, you could be away from God. Maybe you're a Christian, but you're backslidden. Maybe you're, maybe you're lost and you know in your heart that you're not in a right relationship with God and you're sitting there this morning and you're going to walk out of here and you're going to say, well, that was a good sermon. You're going to shake my hand and say, thank you, pastor. And, uh, you know, we'll see you next week or whatever it is. But I want you to understand that there is no transformation by simply hearing a good sermon. There is no transformation. There's no change of life by simply nodding in agreement. This young man could have thought and thought and thought and spent until he died of old age sitting in a pig pen. I really ought to do something different. But the Bible says that uh, he said, I will arise and go. I will arise. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. I'm going to step out. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. And my life is going to be different. I'm not going to do this anymore. In just a few minutes, some of us are going to have an opportunity to, to hear the Spirit of God speak to us. And you need to know that just sitting there and listening and in, agree and in agreement, the music is beautiful, the atmosphere is filled with friendly people, the sermon is, well, the sermon is what we expected perhaps. And you're going to walk out of here and nothing's going to be different. But if you will this morning make that decision, I'm going to get up. I'm going to step out by faith and I'm going to trust God that God has something better for me. God will do it. Then he admitted his sin was against God and others. He says in verse 18, he says, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. That's humility. It's repentance. It says, I have sinned. I've not only sinned against my wife or sinned against my husband or sinned against my children or sinned against the church or sinned against whatever it is, but I've sinned against God and all sin ultimately is against God. And he said, I've sinned against God. How many sins does it take to be lost? How many sins does it take? Sometimes people will say, well, we want to share Christ. We want to say, the Bible says we're all sinners. And somebody says, well, I'm not really a sinner. And then we often use that very familiar illustration. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever had an immoral thought? Well, yeah, I've had an immoral thought. What do you call what Jesus says? That's adultery. So what does that make you? I guess it makes me an adulterer. Have you ever told a lie? Even what we call a little white lie. Well, sure, everybody's told a little white lie. What does that make you? I guess it makes me a liar. Have you ever stole a little something? Maybe just a, a crayon. Maybe you stole just a pencil. Maybe you stole something else. What does that make you? Well, it makes me a thief. So when I asked you if you were a sinner, you said no. But the reality is that you're an adulterer, you're a liar, and you're a thief. According to the word of God. And we're going, okay, when you put it that way, because it is against God first and foremost. The Bible says all of us have come short of the glory of God. None of, there is none righteous, no, not one. But now let me just share with you three things about the Father. And this is what you need to know. Because we're talking about the character of the Father. And I realize that when we're in a crowd this big and there are so many guests here, we all come with preconceived ideas of what God is like. Some of you have come from a situation in which your view of God is that, that he's a mean and that he's a bully and he's just waiting to squash you and send you into hell for all of eternity. Maybe some of us were raised that way or maybe some of us were raised in a church that preached that. But I want you to know that the nature of the Father as revealed in Luke chapter 15 is that number one, the Father never stopped waiting. The Father never stopped looking. The Father never gave up. Verse 20, he arose and went to his Father, but he was a great way off. The Father saw him. Well, how did the Father see him? The Father saw him because he had been waiting. He'd been waiting for his son. Some of us, maybe as parents who have prodigal children, 
We know what it is. Someone told me one time, he said, we always leave the light on in his room. So even though he doesn't call and we don't know where he is, and really we don't even know if he's dead or alive, but if he ever drives by, I want him to know that the light's on and he has a place here. And we would look at him and we would say, welcome home. The father is waiting, he's looking, he's searching for the son to come back. What an incredible thought. How big is God? How awesome is God? What has God done? Well, God, the Bible says, has created the heavens and the earth and all of the universe. And we're told that there are billions of solar systems out there. And there are billions upon billions of stars in the sky. He's created each one. The Bible says he knows the name of every star in the sky. This God who is so big, he created the earth, he created the seas, he created the mountains, he created you, and he created me. The Bible says this God who is so enormous, and yet this God knows me. He knows me. He doesn't just know what my address is. He just doesn't know my name, though he does know my name. He knows my very heart. He knows who I am. He knows my failures. He knows my pride. He knows my sin. He knows these things. And yet, rather than giving up on me, rather than just casting me off, rather than squishing me like the bug that I am and in, in, should be in his eyes, he stands and he waits. And this morning, this is this great, awesome. You're here this morning, and it's not an accident. The God of the universe is extending his hands to you. And he's waiting. And the father, what did he say? No doubt when the son, he probably said to the son, welcome home. I've been waiting for you. What is God going to say to you this morning if you come for salvation or you come for rededication or you come for church membership or whatever it is? What's God going to say to you? He's going to, with open arms, he's going to welcome you to himself. And he's going to say, child, Welcome home. And the second thing is that the father didn't care how he looked or even how he smelled. And we could have, for an illustration, we could have, we could have uh, put a couple buckets of, of pig poop uh, and a couple fans blowing it your way, not my way, but blowing it your way, so you could just get an idea of what this young man must have smelled like and what this man must have looked like. And he comes and he, he comes to his father and, and uh, he, 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 the father sees him and the father embraces him. I like what it said. The father had compassion. He ran. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. He didn't care how he smelled. He didn't care how he looked. He didn't care about the things that he had done because the son was back with the father. And when we come back to the father, he forgives us completely for anything that we have done. He is faithful and just, the Bible says, to forgive us for all unrighteousness. The Bible says that he will welcome us with open arms. You see, the son first took this first step. The father was waiting but the young man came to himself. He looked at his life. He realized that he was making bad decisions. He wanted a different life. He wanted to come back with the father, even if it was just as a servant. But he comes to his father, and the father doesn't look at him and revile him. He doesn't say, how dare you show your face? After all the things that you've done, you expect me just to forgive you. We come, sometimes the devil tells us that if we come before God, he's going to say, why should I, after you blew it, why should I let you into heaven? After all you've done, what makes you think I'll save you? And the Bible tells us that we have a lawyer in heaven. His name is Jesus. And when the devil stands before God and says, why, how, why would you save David Street? Why would you save Jerry back here? Why would you save Betty back here? And then he knows things about us, and, and he, he's, he's a tattletale and a liar. But he's going to tell. And the father looks at the son and says, uh, he's made a good case, this person. And Jesus simply stands and shows his nail-scarred hands. 
And he said, I've already paid for it. See, we're all sinners. Some of us are big sinners. Some of us are little sinners. Some of us were, were short sinners. Some of us were long sinners. But all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we come before God, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. In fact, the Bible says he cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. Now I want you to think about it. Why didn't he say the east from the why didn't he say the east from the west? Why, or the north from the south? He, because there is a north pole and there is a south pole. And we could say, well, I guess it's uh, what, uh, 12, 15,000 miles. That's how far he's forgiven me. But when does the west end and when does the east begin? It doesn't. It just is continuous. And his forgiveness for us is continuous. It's continuous. East, the, the deepest part of the ocean, I've hid your sins never to remember them again. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. And the Bible tells us that the Father doesn't care where you've been, but he cares where you're going. He cares not about your yesterday. He cares about this moment. Behold, this is the appointed time. Now is the day of, of salvation. The Bible tells us that he didn't care. And then thirdly, the father truly forgave his son. He truly forgave his son. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, he noticed where he didn't even, he didn't even say anything to his son. You know, it was just, you know, don't, you don't have to explain. Let me show you what forgiveness looks like. Let me show you what reinstating you as my child looks like. And the Bible says that he simply turns to those who are part of his uh, family and the servants, and he says, bring forth the best robe. You see, the robe was a sign of, of, of his family. It was also that which would cover the unrighteousness of, of the son. Isaiah 61, 10 tells us that God covers us with a robe of righteousness. And this son, all of, his, all of the dirt, all of the filth is covered by a very expensive and a very nice robe that says you're not the person that you used to be. Now you're wearing the robe. He put a ring on his finger. That's the ring of sonship. It says you identify with your family now. He put shoes on his feet, indicating that there was going to be a new walk in his life. There was going to be a new time in his life. He said, kill the fatted calf. Verse 24, the son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and he began to be merry. This morning, the prince, the point of why Jesus is telling this parable is simply to remind them, to remind all of us that Jesus Christ and God the Father love you. They don't care where you've been. Today is a brand new day. And maybe you're here this morning and you're not saved. He wants to give you the robe of righteousness to cover your sins. He wants to cover the, the mistakes and the failures of the past. He wants to put his arms around you. He wants to love you. He wants to care for you. This morning, he wants to give us the son, the, the sign of fatherhood. He wants to tell us that we belong to him, that he's ours, and that there's an eternal bond between father and son because of the work of Jesus Christ. Oh, the Father is waiting for us. He wants to give us a new life that is illustrated in the sandals. I know that they've taken you in the wrong direction. I know they've taken you where you, you, you they've taken you where you didn't want to stay. You didn't, didn't want to live there. Kept you longer than you wanted to. It cost you more than you, you thought it was going to cost you. But I want you to know I want you to know that I love you. I want you to know there's forgiveness in Christ. Picture, if we would, our Father, our earthly fathers, 
how we would have loved to be able to hold, to hold them and for them simply to say, welcome home. And our Heavenly Father, to be able to hold him and have him hear the words, welcome home, welcome home. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you could come home to him. He rose again on the third day to prove that he was who he says he is. And he is willing to do what he promised he would in your life. If you're here and you don't know for sure that heaven is your home, we invite you to come. If you're a child of God and you've wandered, he's not going to beat you if you step out and come and kneel around an old-fashioned altar and say, God, forgive me. I want to leave this place different than when I came. Whatever the need of the hour is, we're going to sing a hymn. And I'm going to ask you if you'd stand together. <laughs> 